from the backwoods of the frontier. He arrives on the national stage. Honest Abe, the Simple Plains lawyer. Frank, candid, and forthright. This is the Lincoln we know, but it's not the whole truth. Beneath this mythic surface lies a master politician, a skilled manipulator, and a clever tactician, bending men to his will. Many realized at some point that they were just chess pieces on Lincoln's board. Abraham Lincoln, American mastermind. Every American schoolchild knows his image. The frontier roots, towering height, and honest reputation are all legendary. But he's also a man of surprising cunning and calculation, one skilled at manipulating men and shaping his own image. Without these talents, he would never have been elected president. Winter, 1860. Lincoln is a prominent lawyer in the town of Springfield, Illinois. He holds no political office, yet audaciously seeks the biggest prize of all, the White House. Gaining his party's nomination won't be easy. Compared to his rivals, he's seen as a political featherweight. And Lincoln knows that image is everything. As the clerk of a troubled store, he earned the nickname Honest Abe by repaying his creditors instead of hiding from them. Now, he cleverly exploits this reputation by presenting himself as a simple man of integrity. Songs are even composed praising his honesty. Though the image was built on truth, it was by no means the whole truth. I guarantee you, those who knew Lincoln best uh, never called him Honest Abe or Old Abe. So Lincoln was a very shrewd manufacturer of his public image. People knew Lincoln as a small town lawyer, but in his youth, he had occasionally split a fence rail or two. How do you package someone like that? Well, you package him by going back to his roots on the farm and asserting that Abe Lincoln is simply a good-hearted man straight from the land, a rail splitter. Which was a much more politically potent image than Lincoln the railroad lawyer, which is in fact how he'd made his living. To drive home the point, his supporters drag fence rails into the convention hall. Even though Lincoln finds the image undignified, he plays along. The Republican Party prints thousands of rail splitter leaflets and distributes them throughout the country. Lincoln becomes a household name. Lincoln had an instinctive grasp of how to sell himself. And it was something that evolved and grew and became more sophisticated uh, as Lincoln himself did. Lincoln's powers of manipulation are evident early in his life. He first learns to influence people as a young man on the frontier. At age 22, he leaves his family's remote cabin for the town of New Salem, Illinois. Here, he faces a tough crowd. The Clary's Grove boys in New Salem were the local ruffians. Uh, they were up to all kinds of mischief. They were the hellraisers of the frontier. The bullies of New Salem see a chance to humiliate the newcomer. So they challenge Lincoln to a wrestling match. According to some witnesses, the gang's leader plays dirty. But Lincoln doesn't give up. His willingness to stand and fight has a profound impact on the Clary's Grove boys. Lincoln, far from further aggravating the opinion of this local gang, actually won their admiration. And it's the first great indication of the persuasive power that Lincoln had with people. He loses the match, but learns an important lesson, turning one's rivals into
to allies has its rewards. They helped him win elections. They, they went out and voted for him at elections and promoted his candidacy in other villages and, and helped him to win his first election to the legislature. In 1837, at age 28, he first arrives in Springfield, Illinois, and casts his spell over voters and juries alike. But the younger Lincoln doesn't limit himself to the high-minded rhetoric that will make him famous. He excelled at slicing up his political opponents with sarcasm. The problem was he learned fairly early on that sarcasm makes you as many enemies as it does friends. Lincoln's sharp wit eventually gets him into trouble. He publicly ridicules a politician named James Shields, calling him a fool and a liar. In response, Shields challenges him to a duel. Lincoln will not be dubbed a coward, but he faces a real threat to his life. So he manipulates the situation by laying down the terms. For their weapons, Lincoln skips the customary pistols and instead chooses swords. The reason soon becomes clear. Before the duel began, Lincoln emphasized his long reach by taking his saber, his sword, reaching up and slicing off a branch of a willow tree above him and giving Shields an idea of how long his arms were and what he might do to him in the course of the duel. Lincoln also demands they place a board between them that neither can cross. This gives Lincoln, with his long limbs, a natural advantage. The two men soon reach a peaceful agreement and the duel is called off. Though Lincoln is learning how to influence others, ironically, one of the few minds he has trouble controlling is his own. Mastering his emotions is not an easy task, for he struggles inwardly with depression. Ghosts from the past haunt him. The death of his mother to milk poisoning, his baby brother in infancy, his sister's death in childbirth, and the death of Anne Rutledge, his rumored sweetheart. These losses predisposed him to depression, and then later when he suffered setbacks in his political career or other losses, it reminded him of these early losses and the pain that he felt then. If what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful face on the earth. In 1841, his best friend leaves Springfield. His engagement to Mary Todd falters, and Lincoln goes into deep depression. A friend worries he might even commit suicide and remove sharp objects from his reach. But Lincoln reassures him, saying he couldn't take his life for he had not done anything worthy of being remembered. Lincoln used work as a cure for depression because it constantly got his mind off thinking about himself and what he felt like and onto something that existed objectively outside of himself. In 1858, Lincoln enters the Illinois Senate race. He knows he's a long shot, but never one to walk away from a fight he challenges the incumbent, Stephen Douglas, to a series of debates. Citizens of the great state of Illinois. Now, you can almost hear Douglas thinking out loud. I'll show him who's really in charge. It was the greatest mistake Douglas ever made. Before proceeding, let me say that I think I have no prejudice against Southern people. I believe that they are just what we would have been had we been born in their circumstances. If slavery... Lincoln has set the ultimate political trap. He's made a much better known political personality elevate him to equal status by sharing a platform with him in seven cities. I leave you now 
hoping that the lamp of liberty may burn ever more brightly in your own heart. Thank you. Lincoln's courtroom skills give him an edge. But his performance isn't flawless. And during one debate, he exhibits strange, troubling behavior. I accuse Mr. Lincoln of not supporting our efforts. When Douglas attacks his voting record, Lincoln becomes enraged. He grabs a fellow lawmaker by the neck and demands he refute the charges. It is a downright lie, and I won't have any more of it. He could explode in anger um, relatively frequently. Lincoln's friends notice other odd behavior, incoherent rambling and insomnia. The idea of Abraham Lincoln, a man of infinite patience, being quick-tempered and prone to bizarre episodes, intrigues historians to this day. Now, scientists may have discovered an explanation for these outbursts. It is a downright lie, and I won't have any more of it. You have heard many... For words. years, Abraham Lincoln treated his depression with a medicine common in the late 19th century, known as Blue Mass. To understand the impact Blue Mass had on Honest Abe, scientists at the University of Minnesota are manufacturing the 19th century formula. We went back to uh, some of the old pharmacy literature, uh, specifically to find a recipe for the Blue Mass pills. Crushed licorice root, sugar, rose water, honey, dried rose petals, and one ingredient that would be unheard of today, mercury. Mercury is a dangerous neurotoxin that poisons the brain, often resulting in unpredictable behavior. The usual dosage of this uh, was one of these two or three times a day. So Mr. Lincoln was exposed to about 9,000 times greater amount of mercury than would currently be considered safe. By taking the pills, Lincoln may have inadvertently poisoned himself. But even he notices their side effects. Concerned that they're making him irritable, he eventually quits using the pills he'd relied on for decades. Despite possible medicinal handicaps, he fares well in his 1858 debates with Stephen Douglas. Although he doesn't win the Senate race, he claims a valuable consolation prize, publicity. What Lincoln gains from that is a national reputation for having taken on the little giant and very nearly upset him completely. Lincoln knows well that this is the perfect time to build a national reputation, thanks to the technological innovations that boost his newfound fame. Shorthand allows journalists to take down every word. Using the telegraph, they then wire their stories to editors hundreds of miles away. And with steam-powered presses, newspapers are quickly mass-produced to satisfy a nation's growing curiosity. The debates propel Lincoln onto the national stage. Overnight, he's a political celebrity. He capitalizes on this by publishing both an account of the debates and a campaign biography. Then, at the 1860 presidential convention, he steps back and lets his handlers loose on the delegates. They use counterfeit tickets to flood the gallery with supporters and negotiate backroom deals that all but secure him the nomination. He was able afterwards to say, I didn't actually sign off on any of these deals, so his hands were clean. But that sounds a little bit like plausible deniability. In a stunning demonstration of political brilliance, Lincoln, a virtual nobody just three years before, emerges victorious. His honest reputation and savvy campaign staff help him clinch the Republican nomination. But when his team shows off a portrait at the convention, the response is unexpected. 
apparently all the cheering stopped instantly as if the, the sound had been turned off uh, in a movie theater. And everybody was just, what, what's that? Is that the guy we just nominated? And they took the picture out. They said they never saw a picture have such a terrible effect on a crowd. In some photos, he looks more like a crazed wild man than a presidential candidate, a fact not lost on Lincoln. But Lincoln is quick to turn a weakness into a strength. Though photography in 1860 is in its embryonic stages, he soon realizes the power of this new medium. He stops by the studio of famed photographer Matthew Brady. So many of the early photographs focused on those imperfections and those creases and molds and lines and all of that. Brady moved the camera back to emphasize Lincoln's physique and his stature. And then at the last minute, he says to Lincoln, would you mind pulling your collar up? And Lincoln says, I see, Mr. Brady, that you'd like to shorten my neck. So Lincoln tugs his collar up. And just when he does it, Brady's operator snaps the camera. The result is a powerful image, dignified and presidential. It radiates confidence. Lincoln's campaign mass produces and distributes the photo, plastering his face everywhere. And that was the way Abraham Lincoln was really introduced in 1860, in colorful images that masked his imperfections, that plastered down his hair, took some of the lines out. I mean, he was airbrushed generations before anybody knew what airbrushing was. These photos play a vital role in the campaign. In the final weeks of the race, instead of giving speeches, he poses for photographers and sculptors every chance he gets. By contrast, his old rival, Stephen Douglas, hits the campaign trail, a critical mistake. In the 19th century, a presidential nominee who actively campaigns is seen as desperate. Stephen Douglas did campaign and was ridiculed for it. Lincoln won the campaign honors because his picture campaigned for him. From near obscurity, Lincoln rises to the highest office in the land. On March 4, 1861, the rail splitter is sworn in as President of the United States. But he continues to polish his image. It's no accident that Lincoln has over 130 pictures taken, far more than most public figures of his era. After he's elected president, he adds the finishing touch a beard to hide his rough features. His handlers have recommended this for months. But being a savvy politician, Lincoln attributes his new whiskers to advice from a young fan. If you will let your whiskers grow, you would look a great deal better for your face is so thin. All the ladies like whiskers and they would tease their husbands to vote for you. But crafting a public persona is a double-edged sword. The press can easily damage his reputation. And during his inaugural train ride from Springfield to the Capitol, they get their chance. The closer he got to Washington, the more ugly rumors began to accumulate that a plot against his life was afoot. By the time that he had reached Philadelphia, discussions about this plot were reaching a fever pitch. The famous detective, Alan Pinkerton, urges him to keep a low profile, but Lincoln wants to avoid the appearance of cowardice. However, the danger is very real. To arrive at the capital, Lincoln will have to switch trains in Baltimore, a hotbed of Southern sympathy. It's the perfect ambush point. Well, at that moment of transition, Lincoln would be quite vulnerable to some kind of riot, a mob, an assassin. Lincoln learns of a conspiracy to kill him while he changes trains. He's reluctant to alter his schedule, but his advisors are persistent. Finally, Lincoln was persuaded to take a night train 
under cover of darkness and an assumed name. Lincoln decides on a covert mission, one involving deception, secret agents, and a dangerous gamble. During his inaugural train voyage, Lincoln weighs rumors he'll be assassinated while switching trains in Baltimore. It was a volatile, volatile city, and, and there were very few friends of Abraham Lincoln in Baltimore. So in Pennsylvania, he abandons his inaugural schedule. Instead, he'll take a series of secret night trains. On to Philadelphia. Nearing Baltimore, he and his bodyguard meet up with Detective Alan Pinkerton. Lincoln skips his usual top hat in favor of a soft cap and shawl. He's even offered a weapon, but refuses it. Instead, he follows Pinkerton into a waiting carriage to pass the hours. Just before their train is scheduled to depart, they meet up with a woman pretending to be Lincoln's sister. In fact, she's also a Pinkerton detective, tasked with securing their bunks. Finally, the conductor is given a package and told to rush it to Washington. Little does he realize, the real package is the president-elect. Lincoln arrives in Washington physically unharmed, but wounded politically. The newspapers fell on this like vultures. They ridiculed Lincoln. What did Lincoln think he was afraid of? What a scaredy cat. The damage to his reputation is worse than he'd anticipated. Vicious cartoons mock his behavior and disguise. Some even show him dressed in woman's clothes. It was at that point that Lincoln resolved in his own mind that never again would he allow himself to be frightened into doing something silly by threats of assassination. Public sentiment is everything. With public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. Although Lincoln's been attacked by the papers, he realizes how much he needs them. In fact, he goes out of his way to embrace the press. Lincoln enjoyed the newspapers. He also understood their power for shaping public opinion. And he manipulated them with as much cleverness as he manipulated members of Congress. Lincoln makes friends with reporters and editors. He hangs out at newspaper offices. Occasionally, he even ghostwrites editorials. After delivering a speech in Springfield, he not only gives a copy to a journalist, but follows him back to the office to check the final article for errors. When he becomes president, Lincoln makes a shrewd decision. To this point, new administrations had singled out their favorite paper to act as a mouthpiece. Lincoln skips this tradition and establishes a White House press corps. He will let them fight amongst themselves for scraps of information and favor from him. He's a master at using subtle influence to control fellow politicians. And he needs to. For many party leaders underestimate him. They fear he's nothing more than an uneducated frontiersman. I don't know where the mistakes are. That made Lincoln successful in November, but it also fed the uncertainties, the doubts, even the enmities of some of his fellow Republican politicians. Many fought him for the nomination and still feel the sting of defeat. Instead of ignoring these rivals, Lincoln disarms them with a brilliant tactic. He invites them to serve in his cabinet. One of the reasons Lincoln did this was because he knew that in order to unify the party, he had to have all factions represented, the radicals, the conservatives, the moderates. And it showed a lot of self-confidence on Lincoln's part because he knew that people regarded him as infinitely inferior to them and infinitely less worthy of being president. Two of Lincoln's appointments are especially headstrong. Secretary of the Treasury, Salmon Chase, and Secretary of State, William Seward. 
Seward doesn't think much of Lincoln and says so openly. Extremely disappointed. Disappointed? You're disappointed? Seward erupted in anger and said, I, who have founded the Republican Party, who have been its intellectual head for years, have had to be passed over by this backwoods lawyer from Illinois. Disappointed. But as much as he can't stand Lincoln, Seward despises Sam and Chase even more. When he hears his arch rival has also been appointed to the cabinet, outlined in this memo, he's so upset he submits his resignation. But Lincoln doesn't accept it. Mr. Seward, you're a man of talent and ability. Instead, he turns Seward into one of his closest allies. I ask you to take this position because I need that ability. Lincoln very gently but very firmly put him in his place. And as a result, Seward worked very closely with Lincoln. And they became very close friends. Lincoln's subtle influence keeps his cabinet in line. But his powers of manipulation are tested by a greater challenge, civil war. In the winter of 1860, the nation sits on a powder keg with war looming. Many doubt Lincoln can handle this tense situation. His critics once again underestimate the man. As early as his inaugural address, Lincoln is already stacking the deck in his favor. The important thing is to lay the groundwork so that if war comes, it will be forced upon the North by the South. In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. Lincoln knows whoever fires the first shot will be seen as the aggressor and lose popular support. Tensions are high after South Carolina's secession from the Union. In response, federal troops had retreated to Fort Sumter, an island garrison on the coastline. This doesn't sit well with Confederate leaders, who claim the fort as their own. Lincoln knew that Fort Sumter would be contested. His insistence all along had been Fort Sumter's federal property, which was a real finger in the eyeball of South Carolina. So the Carolina militia lay siege to the fort, trapping dozens of federal soldiers. After analyzing the situation, Lincoln's cabinet presents him with two options. He can send in troops to defend the fort, but any show of force could drive the border states, Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri, into joining the Confederacy. And defending Sumter would require a large number of troops to secure the surrounding coastline. How many will he need? General of the Army Winfield Scott estimates between 20 and 30,000. Well, where is he going to get that? There's only 16,000 soldiers in the entire United States Army in 1861. But the alternative isn't much better. It makes him look weak. Lincoln can concede the fact and turn over Fort Sumter to the Confederates and evacuate the garrison, in which case his administration is dead on arrival. The first challenge the Confederates make to his authority as president, he is conceding to them. Lincoln sees a third option. He decides to send not men or arms, but food and supplies. For a lengthy standoff would cause the secession movement to lose steam. This puts the pressure back on the Confederates. If you decide you're going to intervene, you're going to have to do it quickly. Before that ship with the supplies arrives, you're going to have to use artillery to blast Fort Sumter into submission. Exactly as he'd foreseen, South Carolina fires upon Fort Sumter. It soon falls into Confederate hands. Although Lincoln has lost control of the garrison, he's kept the border states neutral and won something greater, the support of the North. When Lincoln issued a call for 75,000 volunteers, uh, he was swamped 
far more than 75,000 people responded. But getting his military to act is more difficult than he realizes. Lincoln's authority is questioned by his commanders, especially General George McClellan. Early in the war, Lincoln had promoted McClellan to lead his armies. Their relationship started off well, but quickly soured. McClellan took a demoralized, defeated Union army, whipped it into shape, restored its morale, equipped it and trained it and supplied it well, but then had no nerve to actually use it in a fight. McClellan's reluctance to engage the enemy tries Lincoln's patience. For months, he urges the general to be more aggressive. Even after a hard-fought victory at the Battle of Antietam, Fire! McClellan refuses to pursue Lee's army. Instead, he blames the delay on his tired cavalry. Lincoln telegraphed back, what have your horses been doing lately that fatigues anything? Instead of heeding Lincoln's pleas, McClellan repeatedly snubs the president. Lincoln would go visit him, and he wouldn't bother to, to get out of bed. Um, he would say he was busy with breakfast. Time and again, McClellan treated Lincoln with abject contempt. Many politicians wouldn't stand for this, but Lincoln favors logic over emotion. He controls his temper and removes his ego from the equation. Lincoln wouldn't take things personally and was therefore able to keep the North united, to keep the Republican Party united, and that unity was the secret to Northern success. Lincoln is a master at pulling strings behind the scenes. But to preserve the Union, he feels compelled to step out from behind the curtain. In 1862, his desire to take control leads him to do something that shocks his advisors. The president takes personal command of his armies in the field. Spring, 1862. The war is going badly for President Lincoln. What was supposed to be a short engagement has stretched over a year, and the news keeps getting worse. From its Norfolk port, the Confederate ironclad Merrimack devastates the Union Navy. Lincoln, seeing no other option, takes the unprecedented action of personally commanding troops in the field. No one thinks Lincoln is serious, but his trip to the front lines is no joke. Lincoln is willing to micromanage the smallest detail if he has to. I think that a flanking action is probably our best bet. I think he was impatient with McClellan. He was impatient with the, the sluggish pace of Northern advance. So he decided to go and do a little generaling himself, or in this case, a little admiraling. Lincoln commandeers a ship to scout landing points for an amphibious assault. He wants to reclaim the valuable naval yard at Norfolk. Having found a suitable landing site, he presses his generals into action and launches the attack on the Norfolk port. McClellan has overestimated the enemy size there. Outnumbered by Union forces, the Confederates retreat and hand Lincoln a great victory. Norfolk was taken and the Merrimack was then scuttled and it was a brilliant campaign by Lincoln and the soldiers and sailors who were involved said if, it, if Lincoln hadn't come down here and galvanized everybody, it wouldn't have happened. Lincoln, the political mastermind, has now added military strategist to his portfolio but his senior officers are appalled by his lack of training. His southern foes are highly skilled in battle tactics. Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, has impressive credentials. Jefferson Davis had been to West Point. Jefferson Davis had been a hero of the Mexican War. Jefferson Davis had been a distinguished secretary of war. Lincoln had no such credentials or background. Early in the war, Lincoln realizes he lacks knowledge in military strategy. So he turns to the same place he learned to practice law, the pages of books. He went to the Library of Congress and ordered books. He read them, and suddenly he knew as much about war strategy as anybody who had gone to West Point. Having done his homework, Lincoln is eager to put his knowledge to use. 
so he writes his generals, outlining his thoughts. While the North has superior numbers, a larger army and navy, the South has interior lines, road and rails to quickly transport their troops and outmaneuver the Union. Lincoln weighs these strengths and then suggests a course of action. We must fail unless we can find some way to making our advantage an overmatch for his. This can only be done by menacing him with superior forces at different points at the same time. By attacking from both the east and west, Lincoln can prevent the Confederates from simply shifting their forces. However sound his strategy, Lincoln struggles to convince his generals. Lincoln finally found some generals who would actually do it. And when Grant and Sherman and Sheridan and Thomas then start putting the pressure on all fronts, Lincoln says, well, finally, that advice that I've been trying to get my generals to adopt for the past two and a half years is being taken. By 1864, the country is soaked in the blood of its soldiers, blue and gray. By war's end, nearly 620,000 men are dead. After years of fighting, Lincoln is under incredible pressure to justify the terrible sacrifice and bloodshed. On one side, he has abolitionists clamoring to give the war a moral purpose. But Lincoln worries what freeing the slaves might do to his army. His generals advise against it. General McClellan is telling Lincoln in no uncertain terms that white men will not fight to free black men. That if you turn this into a war about the Negro slave, then northern armies will dissolve overnight. Lincoln faces a dilemma. He needs the manpower black soldiers can provide but risks losing the white soldiers if he frees the slaves. So he's careful not to reveal his intentions. While he's publicly denying that he has any intention of moving on emancipation, privately he in fact is writing a draft of the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln waits for a Union victory before proceeding. And when he finally makes the announcement, he emphasizes the practical benefits. The proclamation only frees slaves in Confederate states. It reduces the Southern workforce and adds 200,000 black recruits to Union ranks. At the same time, Lincoln begins to cast the bloodshed in a new light. He persuaded people that there was a secondary cause to the war, that Union meant liberty, that liberty would preserve the Union. It was intertwined. Every man has a right to be equal with every other man. In this great struggle, this form of government and every form of human right is endangered if our enemies succeed. Overnight, Lincoln redefined the war. No longer is it a war about states' rights. It becomes a war for human rights. Lincoln's shrewd mind infuses the war with a new purpose. As the fighting intensifies, he continues to be a hands-on commander-in-chief. But Lincoln's lack of experience occasionally shows through. And when the fighting reaches Washington's borders, he makes a critical blunder. July 11, 1864, a Confederate raiding party sneaks to the outskirts of Washington. At Fort Stevens, they engage Union forces. With General Grant occupied to the south, Lincoln decides he'll supervise the action himself. Flushed with confidence, he walks right into the line of fire. Lincoln wanted to go out and see the fighting. And so he did. He went out and, and stood on the parapet and observed the Confederate forces coming and the Union resisting them. Lincoln is so fascinated by the battle, he ignores the danger. Up on the parapet, he's exposed to Confederate sharpshooters. 
And by that time, everybody knew who Abraham Lincoln was and what he looked like, and he was the tallest target in the United States. Despite the mounting casualties, Lincoln continues to stand his ground. The staff officer for the 6th Army Corps yells at Lincoln, Get down, you fool! You're going to get shot! Lincoln retreats to safety, miraculously unharmed. Although many question his judgment, no one questions his bravery. The next day, he returns to boost morale. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for your service. Lincoln showed some physical courage in his willingness to go out and, and also some curiosity about how the war was going. And he felt great empathy for the troops and wanted to show his solidarity with them. His involvement with the troops pays off politically. By 1864, the country is war weary and Lincoln's reelection prospects look bleak. He squares off against George McClellan the Army's former general. Surprisingly, the soldiers' vote goes overwhelmingly to Lincoln. And soldiers appreciated that he cared about them, that he sympathized with them, that he was in their corner. And they would say when something went wrong, once uh, Father Abraham finds out about this, it'll be fixed. Lincoln lives up to his fatherly image. He identifies with the troops because he shares a humble background with them. And this makes their deaths all the more painful. In turn, soldiers understand that he shares in their suffering. It even seems to take a physical toll. In just a few months, he loses weight dramatically. He looked like someone who had internalized all the carnage and suffering of the war inside himself. He looked like death warmed over. Whichever way it ends, I have the impression that I shall not last long after it is over. The springs of life are wearing away. Lincoln senses that he has little time left, and in his last few months, uses his persuasive powers to their full extent. He knows that the Emancipation Proclamation could be overturned. So he permanently bans slavery with a constitutional amendment. By one means and another, people who had previously opposed the 13th Amendment decided to stand back or to vote in favor of it, and the man operating the controls behind the curtain was that rough, intelligent farmer, Abraham Lincoln. But Lincoln's days are numbered. On April 14th, 1865, an assassin ends his life. After his death, the image Lincoln helped create rises to take his place. Well, the rail splitter Lincoln is much closer to our idea of rough-hewn, muscular, frontier democracy. It's a very appealing image. It brings him closer to us. But the real Lincoln remains elusive, for he's shrewder, craftier, more manipulative than the myths portray. With an invisible hand, he bent men to his will and did it so well that only now are we coming to understand his methods. For Lincoln's greatest trick was hiding his talents, disguising himself as a simple, unassuming man from the plains. Lincoln knew how to use both the intelligence and the conclusions people were coming to when they met him. He knew that they were underestimating him and he let them. <laughs>